this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That is the sports betting podcast here on the FanDuel Podcast Network, where today we're talking tennis, getting you set for the U.S. Open and how you bet tennis and I think I'm going to learn a whole lot for today. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng of The Power Rank. You can find him on Twitter at The Power Rank. Ed, we're talking tennis today with Whale Capper, and I know literally nothing about tennis outside of I know who Serena Williams is, and I appreciate everything about her. What about you? Are you, are you off? Are you, do you have a head start over me when it comes to tennis knowledge here? Uh, no. Okay. I think there's a guy named Djokovic. He's pretty good. There's a guy yeah. named Dahl who's good on clay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, there's one thing to know about tennis. I'm pretty sure I remember the rules of the game, but I think it'll be right. a whole another ball game to think about tennis betting. And that's what I'm excited right. to talk about, talk to Will Capper about. And the thing that I like about a lot of these sports that I don't know a whole lot about is that there's a lot of data in them that I don't know about. And like, that's why I got into golf was because there's actually a lot of data behind it. And it was a really fun sport to learn because as someone who can grasp a sport a lot easier when there's data behind it, it made it a lot of fun. I'm sure the tennis is the exact same way. We're going to talk to Whale Capper about all that. You can find him on Twitter at whale underscore capper. He is the host of the Deep Dive podcast. He's an NFL, NBA, and tennis handicapper. And the third time we've had him on, third separate sport. So we're going to talk about the U.S. Open. We're going to talk about betting tennis, what types of markets he likes the most, People he's monitoring for the U.S. Open on both the men's and the women's side. So it should be a fun conversation. We'll get Will Capper in here in just a little bit. But first, I want to go through our schedule for the NFL and college football regular season. Because next week is week one of the college football season. Now, next week, our schedule will be the same. We'll have a Monday and a Thursday podcast. But each week during the regular season... We're going to have one episode dedicated to that week's college football action and one episode dedicated to the NFL. The college one will be uh, on Wednesday. We'll record that Wednesday afternoon. The NFL one will be on Friday. So we will not have a college football preview for week zero because we're going to talk with Rob Pozzola about the NFL uh, on Thursday this week. But we may get some discussion around it on Thursday, potentially in the covering in the future segments. So next week begins uh, the full... I guess not the full regular schedule, we'll saw the one on Monday. But uh, once we get in there, Wednesdays and Fridays are when we're recording. But Ed, the fact that we're talking about this means we're close to college football season. And I'm pretty excited for that. There are no more Saturdays without college football for a very long time. Well, yeah, and it kicks off in such a spectacular fashion with Florida and Miami. Uh, this Saturday night, uh, I will be in front of a TV that entire game. Uh, Arizona, (laughs) Hawaii a little bit later, which is not the worst nightcap in the world. no. Uh, maybe not as good as an old fashioned, but you know, um, it's going to be some good college football. Absolutely. We'll probably get some talk in that, uh, on Thursday's show. So make sure you tune in for that. Uh, but also for the regular season shows, just make sure you subscribe to the covering the spread, whether it be on Spotify, Apple podcasts, the Google play store, Stitcher, wherever you find your podcast, you can find covering the spread. And while you're there, please leave a rating and a review for the show. It helps us out a ton. Uh, thank you to those of you who have left reviews already. And again, subscribe so that you can make sure you get each podcast right as it is posted. So you don't have to worry about our schedule, but it will be Wednesday and Friday. Once we get to week one of the NFL season, that's when we'll switch into the Wednesday, Friday schedule. Now, before we bring on Whale Capper, I got to talk about uh, covering the past because I talked about Ryan Blaney and NASCAR last week, and I think it was a pretty interesting one. So let's dive into that, and we'll get into Whale Capper after that. Covering the past. All right, so last week on Covering the Future, I talked about picking Ryan Blaney to win at Bristol, and he opened at 16-1 to at FanDuel Sportsbook, and he was in this tier of six drivers who my model said were, you know, the top six for that race, and they were all pretty tightly grouped. And Blaney actually did separate during the practice sessions on Friday. He had the second-best five-lap average during the opening practice on Friday. He was then first in 10-lap averages during the second practice. And when you combine those two things with his raw speed in practice, he actually wound up being the highest ranked driver in my model in the entire field before qualifying on Friday night. So I think I thought getting him at 16 to 1 was the right call. And then 
Ryan Blaney blew out the power steering pump, which seemed suboptimal at the end of that Friday practice. He actually hurt his shoulder because the wheel jerked to the right so much. Didn't hit the wall, so he wound up being fine. But be partly because of that, it seems like he wound up qualifying 12th. And as a result of that uh, poor qualifying effort, he closed at 19 to 1. And I actually thought that was still a good number, despite the fact he didn't qualify very well. Denny Hamlin, who was uh, one of those top six guys in my model, wound up winning the pole. And he won the race, which means that Ryan Blaney did not win. He did work his way up to second during the race. He was looking pretty good. But then there was a caution before the end of the second stage. And Blaney pitted in order to position himself well for the final stage. And I actually thought that was a good good thought process. I actually applauded that move. But it also put him back in traffic. And Bristol's a pretty volatile place. And eventually he hit the wall because he got caught up in some traffic. And he still wound up finishing 10th. So it was a good race for him. And again, he was up to second, thought he was going to push Truex to the lead there, but uh, disappointed because I think the process here was pretty good given how good he was in practice and the fact that he actually did well in the race before that incident. So overall, I feel like the process was right here. So I don't really feel the need to revisit things too much. I still like Blaney. I was not high enough on Matt DiBenedetto. Uh, he almost won that thing and that was a lot of fun. I liked him in DFS, just uh, couldn't quite get there from a betting perspective. So... Pretty fun event uh, at Bristol. Ed, we're going to finally get you into covering the past year not too long from now because <laughs> uh, with college football season, we're going to do a covering the right. past, recapping each week, so uh, we can but actually I, get some thoughts there. But I'm, I'm, you know, we're we're working our way around here on I, my side. I did have a question for you though. I mean, yeah, sure. You were telling me last time about how Bristol is kind of this small track and a little bit of a blender. Does yeah. that you would probably like those practice times mean less just because there's more nuance and skill? in actually winning the race because it's such a tight course? So to me, the practice times themselves are a better indicator of who will be fast because, like, let's say at Kansas, you can get a little bit of a draft at Kansas, and that's going to make your speeds and practice more volatile because it may not indicate that you're actually a good car. It could, could indicate that you got a draft at a good time and posted a good lap. At Bristol, the draft doesn't matter. So you actually, I think they are going to be more indicative of who will be fast during the race but, like you said, it is pretty volatile. So I, I think that that's why I wasn't super into betting any of the guys who had the shorter odds in the top six. But because Blaney was longer at 16-1, to 1, I thought he was advantageous even when you account for the volatility in that race. Right. So it's a, it's a two-way thing. I think that if you look at practice times in my model, they will have a higher correlation to average finishing or average, average running position at a short track than they will at a bigger track, but their correlation to the finishing position may not be a whole lot better just because there is more, there are more wrecks, there's more volatility. You'll have guys like Blaney who get into traffic and run into the wall. And so that's, that's something to be factored in there too. So I think that in general, I would rather bet longer shots at a short track, uh, sure. but I still right. feel good about guys as long as their number is not too short. And that's why I thought that Blaney was a good one there. Um, I did like Hamlin at, at he was eight to one, um, given that he was starting the poll because he has to deal with less traffic. Uh, so it depends on when you're starting too. And Blaney was starting 12. So he was more in the, in the blender, whereas Hamlin right. was less, less in the blender. So right. I think it depends on a couple of things, but it's a pretty accurate observation because there is more volatility on tracks like that, similar to super speedways as well. Okay. So track type does matter quite a bit, and it's something to account for. Bristol, one of my favorites, uh, didn't go so hot from a DFS perspective this past week, so hopefully uh, with the off week before Darlington, we can get back in the swing of things then. And if you want to get in on the action for Darlington or anything else, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. We'll take a quick break here and we're going to come back in with Whale Capper to talk about the U.S. Open. Once again, follow him on Twitter at Whale underscore Capper. He is a handicapper of the NFL, the NBA, and tennis, and the host of the Deep Dive Podcast, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts. Let's learn some tennis right here on Covering the Spread. Covering the Present. 
Let's welcome Whale Capper back into covering the spread for the third time already. And Whale, this is actually the third different sport. Busy time of year for you. We have the U.S. Open coming up, but also NFL season just around the corner and the NBA landscape. Always very interesting. So busy time for a year of you. I want to appreciate you and thank you for stopping by. How you doing? Oh, I couldn't be better. This is a great time of year. And this is, uh, you know, this is a... Uh... Uh, a perfect kind of ending to if, if you're into you know tennis handicapping you can obviously do it pretty much year round um but here as we uh we wind down on the north american hard court swing entering into this uh two-week stretch that is the u.s open that's like the perfect uh, perfect way for me to end my tennis handicapping season so for you as a tennis fan where does the u.s open rank relative to other events throughout the year it's Personally, it's at the very top because okay. I get to see so much more of it. Um, yeah. the Australian Open, you know, it, it happens in uh, in January, and um, at least two thirds of it is overnight for those of us here in California. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it completely wrecks your sleep schedule, and it's tough to really, you know, tough to really watch a lot of the opening rounds and and get a feel for the event. And then the French Open, while you know, I you, know, you I have a soft spot for clay tennis because it's so fun to watch in general. Um, you know, in my life as a you know heavy duty sports better, it's been you know completely dominated by Rafa Nadal on the men's side. So it hasn't been a ton of fun to watch. There hasn't been right. that, that much drama. Um, Wimbledon uh, is probably second for me after the U.S. Open, but um, you know the 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 uh, the U.S. Open really affords a lot of opportunity for lots of different types of players, and you know there's usually quite a bit of drama. We have a good feel for how everyone's form is at this time of the season because we've seen them play on all three surfaces, and you know we know who's kind of you know in peak form and who's you know who's competing for you know championships here so it's it's a it's quite a a great event to enjoy and be able to watch and perfect way to end the summer so we're trying to get a broad overview here for you uh because ed and i have admitted we know nothing about tennis so we're going to try to get just pick your brain here and try to get you know the basics of tennis betting u.s open specifically gets underway on august 26th and we don't know the draw yet so before we know the draw well are there any markets you're dabbling in before we get that pretty critical information yeah, and you know the draw is uh, if, if you know, as far as long shots go, you absolutely have to wait until you see the draw because um, you know there are uh, there will be certain portions of the draw that are susceptible to someone coming out of nowhere and making a run. Um, but uh, if you kind of sell yourself on you know a hundred to one, three hundred to one long shot now, uh, and then the draw comes out and they're playing Djokovic in round one, then you know you're 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 already right. you're already out of luck there. So, um, you know, so I, I tend to uh, focus kind of on the top of the market um, before we see the draw, because we know Djokovic is going to be the first overall seed. He has by far the most points and, you know, is, is the rightful favorite in this uh, in this men's side. Um, and, you know, I think uh, you would expect to see the two and three seed, although it's not always doesn't always work out this way. But you would expect to see the two and three seed on the bottom half of the draw, uh, which would be Nadal and Federer this year. Um, and, you know, this is uh, it, it does kind of help you know, kind of you put your mind into, okay, well, you know, so if, if Nadal is going to win, he's going to have to beat Federer and Djokovic, right? Whereas Djokovic can kind of, you know, cruise his way into the final and just take whoever, you know, whoever survives that potential, you know, you know, heavy, uh, high, highly anticipated, by the way, we've never seen Federer and, and Nadal play um, on, uh, at, you know, in, in uh, Flushing Meadows before. So that it would be a first ever if they were to happen to meet in the semifinals, but presumably that would be a very high, you know, hotly contested match. And then the winner would be, you know, beaten and battered headed into uh, you know, a showdown with Djokovic. So also, you know, the way that the, the draw will likely shake out, I think you have to see that there's, you know, presumably quite a lot of value on uh, Djokovic, even at, uh, you know, the proverbial, you know, short price of, you know, about even odds here at FanDuel looking at plus one Oh five. Um, you know, which would imply a break-even percentage, you know, just just under fifty-fifty. Um, but uh, with my numbers right now, I currently make Djokovic uh, sixty, a little under sixty-ish percent chance to wow. take hmm. the title. So, and you know, and that is almost strictly born out of the fact that the only other two players who I think have a reasonable shot to defeat him in Nadal and Federer uh, will have to play each other in the semifinals, likely before they face uh, Djokovic in the final. So, well, when you're doing this, so so the NCAA tournament, there's always these matchup issues where you can get a, <clears throat> you know, an upset coming out of a particular region just because uh, that region tends to be kind of weak. Um, are you thinking about the same things in terms of the U.S. Open and the draw in terms of when you talked about waiting on those long shot favorites? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, they, there are there will be certain sections uh, where um, a player who is relatively highly ranked, um, mm-hmm. his game may not necessarily his or her game may not necessarily be suited for the conditions at Flushing Meadows, uh, and uh, and or they may just not be in great form now. You know, they the uh, the players accrue points for ranking over the course of a full season. Um, and you know, somebody who maybe played amazing tennis at Australia and all through the European clay court swing, and then they've, you know, they've kind of completely fallen off, but still have a relatively high ranking. Um, you know, that might be a little section of the draw where you can kind of target, okay, well, I don't have, you know, I think that this, this player, um, you know, presents a, you know, likely candidate to take an upset, you know, like similar to March madness, Mm -hmm. maybe it's a team that, you know, that did really well in, November, December, and January, right. and then struggled down the stretch, and they look primed to be upset. You know that those exact same situations exist in the tennis draw, and if you can find the sections of the draw um, where the uh, you know the presumed uh, favorite bank based on ranking alone uh, looks vulnerable, then you can uh, track down some potential long shots who have some value. So until we get the draw, the loan market that we have as of right now is guy, or whoever's going to win it. On both the men's and the women's side, you can find those odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook. But, well, let's take a bit of a broader view here and try to look forward into the future. You know, just in general, which markets have you found the most value in? Do you like championship odds? Do you like specific matches? Do you like in-match betting? Which market have you found to be most fruitful for your personal style? Yeah, so for these, for the um, for the grand slams, uh, it's absolutely been the outrights. Um, there is a relatively narrow um, there is a relatively narrow band of players who have a, any any realistic chance of winning here, um, and so you can get pretty aggressive as far as handicapping these outright markets. Uh, so when it comes to you know Wimbledon, you know French Open, U.S. Open, Australian Open, like without a doubt, my by far my highest ROI has come from hitting. Uh, um, hitting the outright winners. Um, mm-hmm. after that, it's, uh, it's usually, um, you know, it's, it's usually a combination of the totals market as well as, um, finding some unique, uh, soft spots when you get into some of the derivatives. Um, so just like, you know, just like in the NFL or the NBA, for instance, you'd have derivatives where, you know, you have a first quarter line and a first quarter total, or you have a team total, you know, th- various things like that exist for tennis as well. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you can really kind of corner in, you know, specific angles that, okay, well, even if this player who is the underdog, you know, were not to come away with the upset, you know, the likelihood that they're going to force a fourth set, the likelihood that they're going to just, you know, extend this match in a way that, um, you know, provides value on a on a game's total or a set's total or a correct score potentially. You know, th- those uh, derivatives markets are, you know, in the pre-match uh, uh, space have been very, very uh, kind to me over the over the years. Um, and, you know, if you have if you're if you're watching live and if you have, you know, some semblance of a, of a live handicapping tennis model, um, you know, there are people who exist in this betting space <laughs> that that's like that's like their day. That's like that's their yeah. day job. Right. Like in the right. tennis terminology, they call them traders. Um, and, you know, they're just taking positions high and low on on certain players in in match betting uh, and trading in and out and, uh, you know, you know, um, you know, cornering profit in that that way. And there there is quite a few of those, especially in the European markets. And, and they're they're very, very, very skilled at that. Yeah, that's super interesting because it sounds like there's no U.S. Open madness like we see in March Madness with ups <laughs> and, and winning the tournament, right? Like, I mean, 60% for Djokovic is is a lot. I mean, that seems like a ton to me. And um, yeah, so Will, I want to talk to you a little bit more about your methodology. Um, since you're, you're giving me 60% for Djokovic to win, I presume that means you can get the win probability for any two players once they step on the court. So tell us a little bit about the metrics that go into that and, and your methodology and in, in determining that and surfaces and so on. Yeah, well, your your note your note there about uh, Djokovic being that high is is very very uh, you know it's it's on the nose. Um, men's tennis is in a weird place right now where it's just completely dominated by the big three. Uh, Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic have won um, you know every Slam going back to I think two years ago. Stan Wawrinka oh. uh, won the um, uh, won the U.S. Open in an incredible upset over Djokovic uh, in the final. Um, but you know, since that point in time, it has been just completely dominated by the uh, you know by the big three, and 
you know, really it's just, it's, it's that simple because, you know, as long as these players are playing tennis at the level where no one in the field can, you know, can, can approach them, um, you know, best of, I'll, I'll go back a step, um, <clears throat> in sort of a standard match setting in tennis, just let's say the, the Cincinnati open, for instance, just wrapped up, uh, the men are only playing best of three. So you have to win, uh, two out of the three sets, uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of times it's straight sets, victory two nothing for a given player. Um, and, um, you know, that actually does open itself up to a little bit more, a little bit more randomness, right. a little bit more variance. You know, you can have some situations where, uh, the top player, you know, the better player doesn't always win. Um, but when you get to best of five, which is the uh, setting for these grand slams, that tends to reduce the variance quite a lot, especially later in the, you know, when you're later in the rounds and you really are kind of looking at players who are, you know, one is clearly a stronger player than the other. They tend to win at a relatively high clip. So, you know, it's, it's uh, in, in part, it's the way that the tournament is set up that really lends itself to, you know, some of these favorites being, you know, relatively high likelihood of actually winning. Uh, and, um, you know, as far, but as far as, you know, you want to actually handicap the match between two players, um, you know, this will speak to you, Ed, for sure. It is very, very, very uh, amenable to a, a analytical, statistical um, approach. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have a football, you know, college football match you may be handicapping for this weekend. You have, you know, how many players do you have to incorporate? You know, at least the yeah. 22 starters on each team. And then on beyond that, you know, bench players, beyond that coaching tendencies, beyond that, all kinds of you know, various factors that, that may influence the outcome. Well, in tennis, we have one guy versus one guy or one gal right. versus one gal. And we've got a, you know, a, a, just an enormous amount of data on the strength and skill uh, set that each player brings to that match with them based on their past results. Uh, and, you know, if you, you can come up with some pretty, um, you know, it lends itself really, really well to ELO style modeling. So like, like, uh, you know, right, like you right. would use for, you know, chess players or, you know, or, um, you know, it, it's right in that vein that uh, you can use sure. past results in, in an informed way to to predict future uh, outcomes and just kind of update the ELO scores as you get new results in. And, you know, and, but I and, presume you have yeah. much more fancy stuff than just some ELO rankings. Right? <laughs> well, that's kind of at the backbone. Uh, and then after that, okay. you just have to incorporate the uh, reasonable differentiating factors. So um, the first and most obvious one that comes up when it comes to tennis is what is the surface that this, this match is going to be played on? Mm-hmm. Um, we have the three general, you know, th- there's three general categories, um, grass, clay, and then what's going on now in North America, which is hard court. Uh, and hardcore tennis is kind of in the middle of clay and grass as far as surface speed. Um, and, you know, the way that the, the court itself is, is um, you know, is constructed, uh, they can make a, a, a hard court that is on the slower end of the spectrum that's closer to uh, the speeds that you would find on clay. Uh, and that's actually what we're expecting here at Flushing Meadows. So it's, it's on the slower end of the spectrum as far as uh, hard courts go. Uh, and what that just does is it, it tends to give guys who are traditionally clay specialists a little bit more of a fighting a chance against the guys who dominate with their serve. Um, and so, you know, you've seen some pretty impressive results from Nadal here at uh, at, Roland, at, uh, at Flushing Meadows over the last handful of years. Um, and, um, you know, I think just in general, guys who are particularly good on the clay clay swing, you have to look out for them to make a run here at, uh, at Flushing Meadows just on the basis of they're going to get more points back on return. Um, they're going to get, they are, they're, they're going to get rewarded for being able to move, uh, for being able to run down, track down points. Um, you know, those, those opportunities don't open themselves up when you're on a faster court, like a grass surface or, or a faster hard court surface. So, you know that that the court court speed and, and past performance on this particular type of court and it, and really at this specific venue uh, is hugely influential in terms of refining an yellow style model. Excellent. We're talking here with Whale Capper. He is the host of the Deep Dive podcast, and I think that's interesting stuff for as far as pre match betting goes. When you're watching a match and you want to dive into the the in match betting. Is there something that you look out for to try to identify people who may be undervalued in that market at that, at that time? You know, obviously you could have a model for that as well. But when you're watching a match, is there something that you have an eye on, whether it be a stat or just something that your eye can catch on to that will key you with that I want to bet this person right now? Yes, absolutely. Um, the two, there are kind of two ways that I approach a live betting 
market for tennis. The first is, um, are you generating break opportunities? You know, are you generating, pre- are you putting pressure on your opponent's serve? But are you just kind of get, you know, you're, you're getting unlucky in the kind of capitalizing moments, right? So you're, you're generating break points, but you aren't converting those into actual games won against your opponent's serve. And that's especially important because, um, you know, to win any set of tennis, you need to win six games. And if you can't break your opponent's serve, but you hold your own, and it's 6-6 at the end of the set, then they do what's called a tie break. And the tie break is as coin, it's as coin flippy as it sounds. You know, you just go back point versus point. You know, you're, you're changing uh, the, your, your alternating serve every two points. Um, and the first two seven points winning by two wins the tie break. And that it's a really fragile situation there. And so you can be the better player in a set. You could have generated substantially more opportunities against your opponent's serve, but just not quite converted them and then find yourself in the tie break and lose the tie break. And now here you are down one set to nothing. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people would look at the scoreboard there and think, oh, wow, well, this guy won the first set. He's got a, you know, he's got a huge edge here, uh, you know, to win the match. But a lot of times, you know, if you break down the, you know, the box score a little bit more carefully and you find opportunities where, you know, player A who lost the set actually generated a lot more pressure on their opponent's serve, you know, that can give you an indication, you know, beyond just seeing it with your eyes, that can give you an indication that uh, that they still may be the better player on that day and they may come back and get the win. Uh, and you can scoop some value in that that sense. So looking for, you know, your, your, you know, a specific player who is down, who is, you know, who has, uh, has value um, and just, it just hasn't gotten the lucky breaks to that point in the match. Uh, you know, and trying to back them at that point is a great angle. Uh, and then the alternative to that is some players who you kind of, once you kind of identify their characteristic sort of, I'll, I'll call it a shape, right? Once you kind of identify the shape of how they perform over the course of the match from point one to point 500, you know, you, some guys tend to start slow and build into the match and get just unbelievably good by the end. The best example by far on that kind of shape is is player like Rafa Nadal. A lot of times early in the match, he'll look a little bit vulnerable. He may drop a serve in the first set. He may not even win the first set. But then as, this, as the uh, match wears <clears throat> on, you can get to a point in the third and fourth set where he will just go scorched earth on his opponent and break them with ease. Um, and sometimes that's mental. Sometimes it's you know his specific style and approach. Um, but a lot of, but in those cases, you know, if you see him kind of gar- grab hold, you know, loses a first set, grab, ho- grabs hold of the match in the second set, ties it up one, one, you head into the third set. A lot of times you'll see a price in the, uh, in the game's handicap live where he'll be expected to win the third set by, you know, minus two or minus two and a half games. Right. So they're expecting him to win six, four, or six, three. Well, a lot of times in those actual settings, he is he's rolling now he's got the momentum he's going to he's playing downhill he's got a read on the opponent's serve the serve opponent's serve speed may be down a hair uh and then he goes and beats them six one six one so you can look for opportunities like that to back a games handicap um when you have a player who you know to be kind of building into a match um as you know as you get later and later and Nadal's probably my favorite guy to back that angle on so that's interesting. So you 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 can actually go back through the point by point data and see that you know Nadal wins I don't know seventy percent in the early rounds and maybe eighty five in the later parts of the match. Yeah, it's uh, and it's spe- you specifically want to focus on um, uh, points one versus uh, when when he's returning, right? You you can see it uh, okay. as clear. You can see it as clear as a bell on pretty much every surface except for grass. Uh, where the later the match, the later you are in the match, the, you know, the deeper you are into the match, the more likely hood he is going to win at a given point. But did you say particularly when he's trying to, when he's um, returning, right? Yeah, when he's on return. Yeah, right. It's this is entirely just that because because what sets Nadal apart um, as a tennis player, what makes him unique, and what you know what gives him so much dominance on clay specifically is he's the best. Um, he is he's the most aggressive on return uh, and can when he when he uh, when he's got your serve figured out when he knows what you're trying to do with first and second serve opportunities, you're in deep trouble against him. Uh, and so, yeah, that later in later in matches, he tends to absolutely dominate uh, and on you, return. And then you just can't he just can't be as aggressive on grass. Is that how I'm supposed to understand that? 
Well, grass is funny because the bounce, you know, the the the, the service speed itself um, uh, doesn't the, the surface doesn't take much speed off of the ball, so the ball comes in at a lower angle. It you know it doesn't come up as high. Um, he can do more with a, a return that bounces high higher off the surface, right. uh, and so just the just the uh, the trajectory of the uh, of the ball. <clears throat> and just and in general, like you know, he has uh, limitations physically as far as you know his his knees do not um, you know do not do as well when he's been playing substantial amounts of uh, hardcore tennis or grass tennis, and he tends to break down physically a little bit more readily. Um, and um, you know, so so you know, some of its movement, some of its uh, the, the the trajectory and the the speed of the ball, and you know where you know his his uh, his returning style, he puts um, an amount of. Uh, top spin on his on his return that is um, about 150 percent more spin rate than anyone else that I've ever seen hit a tennis ball. Like it's right. it's it's absolutely ridiculous what he can do with uh, with his spin. Uh, and you know if he's getting a if you if he's getting a ball that's coming up relatively high off the surface and he can put whatever spin he wants on it, then you're you're dead in the water. Hmm. That's very interesting. We were talking about the men's side here, and obviously you mentioned the big three there. What about the women's side? Because it looks like things are a bit more wide open there. Serena Williams, the favorite at plus 490 at FanDuel Sportsbook, but coming off an injury, a little bit of ambiguity there. The set numbers, obviously that's going to change the amount of certainty you can have going into it as well. When you look at the women's side of things, do you view Serena as being the favorite despite, you know, the the injury that she's had? Or are you looking to bet someone a little bit longer odds here? Or do you stay out of it given the increased variance here with the reduced number of sets? Yeah, so I think both is the answer, really. Um, I, I do see Serena as the clear and obvious favorite here. Um, I do think there is a little bit of value if you can get her in the 5-1 to one range. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, we you, you mentioned the injury you know, the injury bug that's kind of been uh, pestering her since she's made her come back from you know, maternity. And yeah, it's there's there's a physical component for sure. You know, she's definitely has not kind of gotten back to the, you know, the sort of the physical specimen that we remember from her being the, you know, the greatest women's tennis player of all time. Um, but at the same time, there's clearly a mental component to it as well. Um, she's had some pretty, um, you know, some pretty clear breakdown performances where she was by far and away the better player in a match. Uh, Australian Open comes to mind pretty readily here. She lost a, a, a late round, um, a late round match to Christina Plish, or actually Carolina Pliskova, who she was substantially better on that day, uh, and was up I think five one in the third set there with the chance to put it away, and you know just kind of tweaked her ankle and then got in her own head, and it all fell apart for her. So you know, there's definitely she's got a lot of pressure on herself to. Uh, to win a slam in her comeback here from maternity leave. And, you know, I think last year um, she lost in the final in a pretty spectacular blow up as well to Naomi Osaka. And just in general, like kind of at the end of these um, at the end of these tournaments where she's in position to win, she's she's faltered a little bit. And it's it's not easy to kind of put your finger on what's going on there. Um, I would look to her performance in the Canadian Oak, the Rogers Cup, which was just in Toronto a couple weeks ago. She performed extremely well through the first three rounds of that tournament. She got to the final. She was having back spasms. She's, she pulled out in the final. Um, and a lot of people have kind of noted from there, oh, well, maybe she's dealing with some lingering injuries. Maybe there's some fitness issues. I'll note, though, that in that tournament, they were playing best of three tennis and she was playing every day. So she had to play mm-hmm. back to back to back to back days. Uh, and that kind of cumulative fatigue seemed to be what was bothering her so seriously in the final. You look at what's going on with the U.S. Open schedule, and she's afforded a much more relaxed schedule here. The women <clears throat> will play every other day, best of three tennis. Uh, and so she'll kind of have an opportunity to kind of build into her. Um, she'll, have, she'll be afforded a relatively soft draw with her, her current points and her current ranking. Um, and she should be able to build into her uh, her strength as the as week one goes on, and then you know week two rolls around. If she's she's kind of peaking at that time, um, it's going to be extremely difficult for any other women in this field to keep up with her. But uh, there's still some long shots I think worth worth looking at. And who are those long shots? Uh, either on the women's side or the men's side? <laughs> um, 
Well, I know I, it's tougher. Yeah. I know we just talked about how so, you don't want yeah, to dabble yeah. in until the draw. But. Well, I think on the women's side, it's it's more straightforward because uh, okay. the women's okay. side, I think, is less um, is less draw dependent in terms okay. of who has a reasonable shot to win. On the men's side, like I guess like <clears throat> and actually, well, we can kind of put a, a period I think on the men's kind of handicap of the whole tournament. Uh, I think you are extremely likely to see Federer and Nadal semifinal. Of those two, I would give. Nadal a a greater chance to make it to that semifinal. Federer, I'm a little a uh, little concerned that he may show some cracks early and get upset. Um, but you're probably looking at a you know a, a five set bloodbath between those two in the semifinal. Uh, and I like Nadal to come through that, uh, and that would set up a, a Djokovic Nadal final where I think Djokovic wins relatively convincingly. So um, I would look for opportunities in the futures market to get an exact you know an exact result here of Djokovic Mm -hmm. over Nadal as as an exact uh you know exact result if you're trying to get a little bit better uh you know a little bit more kind of a lotto ticket price here you could probably you're probably going to be able to find that for like 10 or 12 to 1 or so um and uh and or just a a Djokovic Nadal as the you know the exact final that's probably Mm going to be more like a three or four to one and I think both of those are are worth uh worth looking at as you go to the men's side on the women's side we did touch on yes Serena is the is the clear and obvious favorite in my mind uh five to one is a very fair price to back her at this point um and then if you want to go a little bit deeper down the draw um I think there are two uh American women that are worth strong consideration here um, the young American Sophia Kennan is, uh, right now at about 30 to one. Uh, she has an incredible game. She is poised to break out in this tournament. She has the game that suits her well for this tournament. And, you know, in general, and again, you know, kind of refining the ELO style concept we were, we were talking about before, Ed, uh, if you can incorporate, um, you know, you, you see a pretty clear signal where players perform better at on, you know, on their home turf. Or, and, and, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and so Kennan being the American, Kennan having you know the the home crowd behind her, if she if she puts together a little momentum here, is going to be very very dangerous. So at thirty to one, she makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, similarly, Madison Madison Keith, she's a former finalist here. She just put on maybe the best single week of tennis of her life, winning the uh, the um, uh, Cincinnati uh, Premier event uh, last you know just yesterday, I guess actually just wrapped up. Uh, she was incredibly impressive. Her game is, you know, suits suited very well for for performing at uh, Flushing Meadows. And, you know, she made the finals here two years ago where she was defeated by Sloane Stevens. And I think uh, she has a very realistic shot at making another run deep into this tournament with the, uh, you, know, what, irregar- you know, irrespective of her draw. Um, the only fear would be if, if Keys gets matched up in, say, the same quarter of the draw as Serena Williams, then I'm a little less... Uh, little less confident there but uh i think still at 18 to 1 for keys that's that's still a pretty um that's still a pretty fair price for her yeah and one, sophia kennan uh 29 to 1 as well so right yeah. in the same range where you had her yep. yeah yeah one last question well um so you talked about home court advantage and i'm sure that's something that you include in your model and when you look at your model um you know we, we've talked before about making adjustments in the nfl because it, it, it's hard because the model doesn't capture everything. <laughs> is it way less so in tennis or somewhat less so just because you have so much more data between individuals? Like, do you find yourself making subjective adjustments or do you maybe 90% trust the numbers? I would say it's 90% trust the numbers. And then okay. there are, but, but for, but <clears throat> I also would say that uh, I do, I try to do a, a pretty complete job of quantifying what would be considered subjective adjustments. Mm-hmm. Right. Like okay. you can qu- you can quantify form, you know, you can in, okay. in tennis, it's, it's doable. Right. You know, if a guy who's, you know, got an ELO score that's in the, you know, the, in the upper you know, 95th percentile, if he's losing to guys in the 30th to 50th range and he does it, you know, consecutive weeks, you know, it's mm-hmm. pretty straightforward to incorporate that into a into a metric that captures poor form uh, and downweights sure. him in any given match and vice versa. Right. Um, and then. um but but and that's a big one. Form is a big one, and then the other one that that's also again pretty easy to quantify is is head to head, um, and head okay. head head to head is fascinating and it's important for a tennis handicapping perspective because it kind of informs you on a player has a good read on what it takes to beat their opponent, right? It, mm-hmm. it, it and it kind of comes down to okay do do they have a plan of attack that can be successful 
in this head to head opportunity. And if you look at two players and there's a five to two, you know, record head to head and all of those results are relatively recent. Um, I do a pretty significant amount of time decay when I'm doing this too. Like I'm, sure. I'm looking very, very closely at the last uh, year's worth of data, a little less so at the last two years. And then, um, a third category for all time, basically. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I would say if you're going head to head, if you have good head to head data that is in the last two years in particular, and that informs some signal on, okay, this player has figured out this other player's game and they are going to win at a much higher rate than you would just expect, given that they have rel- you know, you know, somewhat equal strengths. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times that that is a great way to then go and find, you know, value in some of the handicap markets or correct score markets or set sets sets markets and and uh, and vice versa. If it's two players of equal strength and they have a, a head to head record that's, you know, four and four or eight and eight all time. You know, that that could then inform you on, okay, maybe this is a match that you want to look for an over, right? Like this is one that's going to go a long ways because these guys are so familiar with each other's games and it's going to be, you know, it's this is not going to be, you know, three and done here. This is going to go long into the night. Hmm. Interesting. All right, that is whale capper. I feel I feel so much more comfortable now, like talking tennis. Absolutely. So uh, I gotta find some place to draw some knowledge, whether it be you know just a party somewhere. I gotta you know I gotta feel like I gotta talk like I know what I'm talking about, and that is all due to you, whale. Thank you so much for dropping by. Good luck with the U.S. Open. Hopefully the draw goes in your favor for any futures bets you may have down right now, and we'll talk to you again soon. Hey, thanks again for having me, guys, and uh, always always a pleasure to chat with you. Covering the future. One final thank you is out to Whale Capper for coming on here and talking a little bit of tennis. And Ed, I feel feel a lot smarter now after hearing uh, all the things that that Whale had to say about the U.S. Open. Yeah, absolutely. I could have probably bugged him for two hours about his model. <laughs> so it's good that you got jumped in there, Jim, and uh, prevented me from doing that. You know, no, try, try I, I would have loved... a little tight for the listeners. I would have loved to sit back and listen to the entire thing personally, but I also have to, I guess, work allegedly, which is kind of a bummer. I'd rather just sit back and listen to you two guys talk, but uh, we'll have more tennis talk as we get back into the majors later on because Whale is a fantastic guest. You can find him on Twitter at Whale underscore Capper and find his podcast, the Deep Dive Podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Let's finish up here with covering the future, and we're getting closer and closer to the NFL season. So we're both going to talk about NFL teams here uncovering the future, starting off with you, Ed, talking about the Packers. And they are a team we talked to Whale about the NFL. He liked betting the Packers early because of their early season schedule. Like if they were to beat the Bears in week one, things would move for them pretty quickly. What are you looking at here with this Packers team? Yeah, so this Packers team is particularly interesting over the past couple years because They've had a really good rush offense. They've been top five when I look at adjusted yards per carry. And then they've been kind of terrible throwing the ball. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of uh, out, uh, below NFL average, which is not really what you expect, uh, you know, with a team with, with, with Aaron Rodgers. And, and there are reasons for that that we'll get into. But, you know, that's, that's kind of the exact opposite thing you want to do in the NFL. You want to be able to throw the ball well. And, you know, if you can run it, <laughs> good for you. Um, so they've kind of had it backwards on offense, uh, the last two years and, and, but I, I think, you know, there's reasons for that. I mean, Aaron Rodgers didn't even play the whole season two years ago and then he played on a gimpy leg, essentially the entire season. I mean, they opened with Chicago again last year. I thought he was done for the year when that happened. Exactly. And he, and he played it out and, you know, I certainly don't think you can, you know, almost Probably not a good idea, given how much they're paying him and how much they expect him to go, um, you know, play in the future. So I think it's an interesting thing. You know, there's been so much talk. Matt Fleur is the new coach. And how is he going to get along with Aaron Rodgers? And what's the drama? And, and of course, this gives people to things to write about and us to click on so they can get their ad revenue. And and that's all good and great. But I think the real story is Aaron Rodgers is going to be healthy this year from what we know. And, you know, if you can give him any kind of reasonable offense um, with that good offensive line and and with the tools that he have, I mean, Aaron Rodgers is one of the biggest talents we've seen at the quarterback position. And it hasn't worked out the last two years, but I think that alone, you have to be excited about them getting back to where they should be uh, throwing the ball. Um, And then you got to look at the defensive side of things. And this is a team that I was kind of high on last year because they had a lot of young talent in the secondary. 
and it didn't really work out. Their their defense was terrible last year. Their their pass uh, defense in terms of my adjusted success rate was in the 20s. But you also have to consider the situation uh, in terms of injuries. Football Outsiders tracks this, and they were 30th in terms of their injury rate on that side of the ball. And injuries is one of those things that's going to regress to the mean every year. Uh, there's a lot of randomness in injuries. Um, so they should be healthier. Uh, they signed uh, a couple of pass rushers to help them out in uh, that department, Zadarius Smith and uh, Preston Smith, the Smith guys. And I'm still hot in that young secondary. Kevin King is is going to lock down one of the cornerback positions. Uh, Jerry Alexander was pretty decent as a rookie last year. Uh, they also – Signed Josh Jackson and might move him to safety this year. So a lot of high picks there in the secondary. Um, high on them potentially getting that together. And I think Rubik could have a really good season. I'm really optimistic for this team. Um, they're at nine and a half wins. Uh, like I've mentioned before, I really hate betting the over on a on win total that high because any kind of injury or or uh, a lot of things. There's more things that can drag a team down uh, towards the average of eight wins than you know, the luck and the good things that can happen to push him over our nine and a half wins. But I'm expecting a really uh, strong season from Green Bay this year. Well, you were talking about the free agent investments, uh, but they also invested, as you alluded to, in the draft because they had two first round picks because they had that Saints pick uh, from last year as well. They did trade up, uh, but two defensive players in the first round and draft picks do matter. Like they can mm -hmm. move the needle in a pretty quick fashion. They do increase. If you have a high volume of them, they do increase the team's expected win total. And the Packers invest in that defense. You get a healthy Aaron Rodgers. You have uh, those. They have. I would say they have the two best, the best tackle pairing in the league as well uh, mm -hmm. on that offensive line. And they also bolstered their offensive line too uh, by taking a really impressive player in the second round, Elton Jenkins. So. I think that they have depth on the offensive line, which makes me feel better about betting them uh, with that to with that to win total being high because they can afford a couple of injuries. They can't afford an injured Aaron Rodgers, but they can afford some injuries elsewhere. I think their depth is really good. So mm -hmm. I like the Packers broadly, and you were talking about the win total. Do you have any interest in them at 19-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl? Yeah, I think I do. Right. Okay. I mean, this is clearly a team with a high upside when you have an Aaron Rodgers, you get some health on. You know, I feel like we've talked about a whole bunch of teams, Jim, about yeah. they got a quarterback, they got a receiver, right. uh, but they got nothing on defense. I don't feel like that's the case with Green Bay. I feel right. like they have the makings for a decent defense and with just a little bit of injury, a little bit of health and uh, some guys maybe stepping up in their sophomore year. Uh, it, it could be a really good situation in Green Bay. And it's not as if the powerhouses in the NFC are bulletproof. There are, sure. you know, the Rams had their changes on the offensive line. Uh, the Saints, Drew Brees is aged. Uh, we could say that. I like the Eagles a lot, so I don't want to put the question mark label on them as well, and they're also longer. Uh, but I think that the, the Packers are well positioned. So I think that yeah. they're a very interesting team. Yeah, and just, just one more thing. Josh Hermsmeyer talked on my podcast last week about how he thought Chicago could be an overrated team. Uh, obviously, they've been called before. Jacksonville 2.0, and I can't shake yeah. that analogy because uh. I don't, I don't think it's that far off base. Yeah, no, and and I think that's really smart because like you know you have a quarterback that hasn't proven himself. Maybe he had a good year, but he Mitch Trubisky has got a lot to prove. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that I think that's a, a very apt analogy. Yep, and I think their offensive line gets a little bit more pub than it should too. So I would agree that the Bears. Uh, maybe not, maybe should not be the favorites to win that NFC North. Uh, my cover in the future is also NFL related, but I want to talk about the Jets because last week we had Bud Elliott on here talking about college football and he mentioned the importance of coaching changes as it relates to betting teams early in the season. And when the Jets hired Adam Gase, it looked like they'd be moving to a slow paced offense because the Dolphins under Gase last year ranked 31st in situation neutral pace. That is according to football outsiders. And the Jets are 28th, so it wasn't a big deviation, but people did seem to downgrade the Jets despite that. They viewed the Jets as being a, a middling team, when in actuality they were already slow. So adding, adding Gase didn't actually change the situation at all. But this is also a different situation than what Gase had in Miami, because there he had Ryan Tannehill and Brock Osweiler as his quarterbacks, and neither guy is currently a starter in the NFL because Marcus Mariota is going to hold off Ryan Tannehill for that starting job. But when your talent is that bad, and Ed, 
you you know this from like a basketball perspective. When you have bad talent, you want to play slow and you want to increase variance because you're not going to win a game when the sample size gets too large. And I think that that may have been what Gase was doing because he has always said in the press that he wants to run an up-tempo offense. And he hasn't had that right. since his time in Denver. But... As offensive coordinator with the Broncos in 2013, they ranked third in situation neutral pace. They were ninth the year after that. And Sam Darnold is not Peyton Manning. So I think expecting them to rank third in pace is outrageous. But I also don't think that Sam Darnold is Brock Osweiler. And the Jets have been running up tempo so far in the preseason. According to Pat Thorman of Establish the Run, the Jets have gone no huddle on 11 of 23 snaps with Darnold under center in the preseason. They were no huddle just 4% of the time last year. That does not mean that will carry over into the regular season, especially if Darnold does wind up struggling, which is possible because he struggled for the first 12 weeks last year. But I think it does mean they'll be faster than expected, at least early on, as long as Darnold is not atrocious. Their total for their week one game against the Bills is 38 and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook, and I think the over there is a pretty good bet. The Bills' defense is very good, and I respect them. But the Jets' offense should be operating faster, and they may be better this year with Ryan Khalil, Kelechi Osemele, Jamison Crowder, Le'Veon Bell all in the fold, and Gase may push them at a faster pace, not just in what he was last year, but then what they were last year. The Jets' defense is also super banged up with Avery Williamson done for the year, their linebacker, Jermaine Johnson, already banged up. So I think that it makes sense to at least bet the over at 38 and a half, but this would also help boost the Jets' individual player props. If they run a higher pace, that's going to give them more plays, more volume, and that helps out Darnold, helps out Le'Veon, helps out Robbie Anderson, helps out everyone across the board. So I would check those out as well and see if there is a market there you want to dive into. But I think that at least for week one, I want to bet the over for the Jets, the Bills at 38 and a half. I think it makes sense to buy in there. So, Ed, what about with you? Are you okay talking yourself into things like this? Because there really isn't a data-backed reason to say that Adam Gates will run a mid-level pace or even an up-tempo pace this year. But I think based on reading the tea leaves, I am okay reacting to that. What about you? Would you need to see more before you invested based on something like that? Yeah, I think I need to see a little bit more just if they're actually kind of going to see it in in the the regular season. And, you know, I mean, you mentioned that the Bills defense is good. So Mm -hmm. you can't run too many plays if you're going through and out every time as well. So I I do have a lot of respect for Sam Darnold. Um, I think with the right coaching, he could be a great quarterback. And part of partly that's the just the terror of uh, when he just single handedly shredded Stanford uh, his last year at USC. I yeah. mean, the guy the guy did not miss a pass in the first half. I think he, yeah. or he missed one. It was it was kind of dreadful. The um, worry for me so, is that he could be Jameis Winston from an interception perspective, and like that was my top comp for him coming yeah. out of college. So there right. could be a lot of picks. But I think there's going to be a lot of fun throws in there, too. I, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the, the guy the guy clearly has talent. And I'm not sure I buy that he's a turnover machine yet. I know that was kind of a problem as last year in college. And, mm-hmm. I mean, every rookie's going to come in and throw some picks, right? So, right. Um, you know, if he can be accurate with the ball, and, and we've definitely seen that, uh, at, at least at USC, uh, I, I, think, I think that could be good. So... I would wait a little bit more. Like another mm-hmm. example with Bob was talking about, I'm really looking forward to the Michigan mi- middle Tennessee yeah. total, just because like, if you think Gaddis is going to run faster, which I think he will. And right. we know that we have guys that are going to get it done against the middle Tennessee defense. So I'm a little bit sure, more sure from an efficiency standpoint there. Uh, I'm a little bit less sure from an efficiency standpoint for this NFL game one, which is why I'd be a little bit more hesitant. Sure. Um, but but yeah, I mean, clearly, I, I think there should be value in looking at pace. I mean, Bud's clearly done this for the last couple of years in college football. Right. There's no reason not to apply the same thinking in the NFL. Just getting me more college football talk. I like it. I like it. Uh, looking forward to that. Shea Patterson, interesting to see what he can do this year. I think that uh, yeah. he'll be one of my favorite guys to watch this year, for better or for worse. I think that he'll be very interesting. And I'm interested to see how that goes 
for him. That is all we have for today, but another podcast coming up later this week on Thursday. Again, talking NFL with Rob Pizzola, going from a team projection perspective. And we want to, you know, talk somewhat along the same lines of what we discussed here with the Jets. So more of that coming up later this week. Make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, uh, and Stitcher as well. All those spots you can find covering the spread. And while you're there, leave a rating and review as well. Ed, want to thank you for coming on. Uh, anything going on over at the Power Rank over our new podcast this week? Yeah. Well, actually, Jim, it's a huge day uh, for my podcast over the Football Analytics Show. Uh, over the last month and a half, I've been working on a preview series. Yes. So this is 10 episodes. Uh, they're each about 10 minutes long, which I find is... Uh, uh, a good length to tell a, a good story, but not too long for for to people get bored just listening to me talk. So these are ten episodes. It's uh, it's my college it's it's my football preview series. I cover both college football and the NFL. Uh, the first one dropped today. It's about skill versus luck in NFL quarterbacks, and just a completely different approach at looking at NFL quarterback statistics and which ones we can trust and which ones maybe we shouldn't trust as much. Yeah, which unfortunately is something that I use in my model. So it was an interesting episode in which I'm I'm really kind of doubting some of the things I've done in the past, but I think it's a it's good to to kind of refresh and look at what we should put in our model uh, and what we can add later. And then yeah. and then I am talking about Derek Carr and Jared Goff. Oh, uh, are you saying good things about my son Jared? Or bad things. Yeah, well, yeah you got to Okay, <laughs> I'll have to tune in to check it out. But uh, the format of that, um, right. you did a similar thing with the college basketball stuff leading right. to the tournament. I loved that format as someone awesome. who Thanks. can't really pay attention longer than 10-ish minutes to a lot of things. So personally, as a consumer, I enjoyed that. So I'm looking forward to checking out and making sure you are not uh, muddy- muddying the name of my son, Jared. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And Jim, I appreciate the kind words about the March Madness thing. You know, yeah. that was an interesting process for me because like, I felt like the first couple of them were great, but man, I was really tired doing the last couple of episodes yeah. of that series. And so one of the things in my process for this was just to start it out, uh, early enough so that I could yeah. give each episode the time that it deserved. And I've been, I've been pretty happy with that. Um, well, seven of them are recorded as of right now eight and nine will get recorded later this week and still don't have any idea about the 10th but i mean march madness is also a crazy time of year for you so i think you're going to be tired regardless by that point so yeah well uh, it's not like i'm not tired now but i just feel like with a little bit you know that was kind of my test run and trying this process out and i think people like it and um so now with football i've hopefully given myself enough time that that every story deserves your attention whereas maybe the last episode of the march madness one could Does be. that mean you're going to run it back this year with March Madness again? I think so. Okay, good. Yeah, I, don't, I don't see any reason why not to. Uh, there might be eight episodes instead of 11. Okay. So that's that's kind of the right. plan. 11 kind of killed me. I just had to make sure that I'd still be getting my, my podcast goodness once March comes around. So yeah, I'm, well, I'm looking well, forward to that. I mean, you personally can just DM me and we'll right. get all the <laughs> advice that you need. But uh, right. but yeah, for, for everyone else, yeah, we'll, we'll probably do, yeah, almost awesome. certainly doing that again. Well, make sure you check that out. First one, as Ed said, did go up already. So you can check that out and subscribe to his podcast as well. Uh, you can find Ed on Twitter and find all those uh, those podcasts there at The Power Rank. I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you goes out to our producer, Calvin Theobald, for keeping us on the video side of things here. Cal, thank you as always. And a big thank you to Whale Capper for spreading his knowledge about tennis and making me feel like I should lay down some bets, which I never thought I would do for tennis. So <laughs> that tells you a lot about what I think about Whale Capper's insights. I just want to throw one other thing I didn't mention. Uh, my podcast is called The Football Analytics Show. So if you, oh, want, to catch the, yeah, yeah. If you want to catch the preview series, The Football Analytics Show is, I think, pretty much anywhere you can find covering the spread. So I listen to it on Spotify personally, so I know it's there. Okay. That's where I listen to all my podcasts. Excellent. So. Yeah, you can find on Spotify, the Football Analytics Show. Find Ed there. Find us covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. I want to thank you all for tuning in. We'll talk to you again on Thursday to get more NFL discussion. Until then, good luck with your bets. We'll talk to you again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.